All right, how's everybody doing today? All right. All right, so I'm Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. Some people listen to me on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF for seven years or see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered every Friday. So I've been asked to do a presentation dealing with the case for uh, the case for municipal reparations, the case for municipal reparations. OK, and you can come see me at the end uh, if you need any of my information. I got flyers specially made up for you all today. All right. Now, uh, what I want to do in this presentation, hopefully everybody can see is yeah. briefly. This is only 30 minutes. Uh, these are some key points that I want to deal with in this presentation. I speak across the country. I've spoken on multiple platforms dealing with reparations, including the California Reparations Task Force final report that came out June 29, 2023. Uh, we'll briefly look at defining what reparations is, defining specifically with specificity what uh, municipal reparations are, which is different than just general reparations, and why uh, municipal reparations are a good option. Uh, what, but municipal reparations does not uh, absolve the need for reparations at the federal level. We need both. What was Michigan's history of slavery and um, that's important to understand because even though slavery did exist in Michigan up until 1837, Michigan was not Mississippi or Texas or Tennessee or Alabama, if you actually study the history. So it's 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 uh, a lot of things that happened after slavery ended in 1837 in Michigan, especially Detroit, that we definitely need uh, to repair the damage of as well. Uh, why did Michigan have such few slaves in comparison to Mississippi and Texas? Who, who's... Who has never heard of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787? Raise your hand. You never heard of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. This is why it's important to understand history and law. And I, I spoke last Saturday uh, for Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, my fraternity, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, our Black uh, History Month celebration. And one of the things I talked about is history, economics, law, and politics. We have to understand all four, history, economics, law, and politics. Um, I'll mention briefly the California Reparations Task Force. I'm going to give you some sources in this presentation so you to do for you to do more research. Proper, proper documentation ends all conversation. I tell people, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Go research this for yourself. OK, you don't have to believe me uh, in Detroit's history of racism against uh, African-Americans. OK, now, when we look at this historically, historically, the term reparations did not apply to slavery. Historically, when we talk about reparations, it was a levy. Uh, on a defeated country, forcing it to pay some of the war costs of the winning countries. Reparations were levied on the central powers after World War I, World War I, 1914 and 1918, uh, to compensate the Allies for some of their war costs. They were meant to replace the indemnities, which had been levied after earlier wars as a punitive measure, as well as to compensate for economic losses after World War II. 1939-1945, the Allies levied reparations principally on Germany, Italy, Japan, and Finland. If we advance in history later, the meaning of reparations became more inclusive. It was applied, it was applied to payments undertaken by the Federal Republic of Germany to the state of Israel for crimes against the Jews and territory controlled by the Third Reich, the Nazis, and to individuals in Germany and outside, uh, outside it to indemnify them for the persecution. The term was also applied to the obligations of Israel to the Arab refugees who suffered property losses after Israel's victory over the Arab states in 1949, okay, when they set up the state of Israel. If you go to Britannica.com, they have a good article there. This is just a summary of it. Reparations at Britannica.com. Now, when we talk about reparations for African Americans, especially from the federal level, okay? Just a working definition. This is not an endorsement of one organization over another because I, I don't belong to any of them. But uh, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, better known as INCOBRA, defines reparations as a, a, a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. At, at, the, root, at the root of the term reparations is the concept of repairing, repairing the damage that was done to someone, making them whole again restoring them to a position before the damage was done, okay? And as I explained to people, uh, it's important for us to actually study what actually happened as opposed to what we think happened. 
Because when we get deep into this, like if you read the 74 page executive summary from the California Reparations Task Force, their final report released June 29th, 2023. I've read the 74 page executive summary. I'm going through now reading the 1000 page report. The history is, is mind boggling, mind boggling. It's a wonder we survived. Okay. What was actually done to us and how law from the, uh, from the state and federal level and the federal government were used against us to continue to inflict the harm today. Now, uh, those groups that have been injured have the right to obtain from the government, corporation, institution, or family responsible for the injuries that which they need, that which they need to repair and heal themselves. In addition to being a demand for justice, it is a principle of international human rights, a principle of international human rights as a remedy. It is similar to the remedy for damages in domestic law that holds a person responsible for injury suffered by another when the infliction of the injury violates domestic law. OK, examples of groups that have obtained reparations include Jewish victims of the, of the Nazi Holocaust of uh, coming from Germany, Germany, reparations primarily coming from uh, Germany. Um, they put about 90 billion dollars in a pension fund. OK, for uh, uh, Jewish Holocaust survivors, uh, Japanese Americans interned in concentration camps in, in, in the United States, uh, basically uh, 1942 to 1945, one point six billion dollars uh, was set aside to pass Congress in 1988. And they had a, a 10 year window from 1988 to 1998 uh, to uh, to apply. And they got uh, twenty thousand dollars each. Now, contrary to popular belief, this did not apply to all Japanese Americans. This 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 was only issued to approximately eighty two thousand two hundred and fifty. If you want documentation on that, I have it. Um, and that w and that only applied to the Japanese Americans who were actually survivors of the internment camps or those who had to uh, evacuate. It did not apply to all Japanese Americans in the United States from 1998 to 1998. Uh, Alaska Natives for land, labor, and resources taken uh, taken victims of the massacre in Rosewood, Rosewood, 1923, January 1923. Whole town of about 200 African Americans was wiped out. That land was taken and the city of Roseville was removed from the maps. If you study the history, the John, uh, uh, John Singleton directed a movie in 1997 called Rosewood. Excellent movie. A lot of fiction in it, but excellent movie. Uh, and uh, it, Rosewood, Florida, and their descendants, Native Americans as a remedy for violations of treaty rights and political dissenters in Argentina and their descendants. Now, one of the things that has to be, um, and I'm going to continue with this presentation, but when we talk about Native Americans, um, for some reason, people keep leaving out the Black Freedmen Indian Treaties of 1866, which applies to black people. And many of our ancestors were in those treaties, getting uh, benefits, getting land, members of Native American nations like the Creek Indian Nation that founded Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1834. And when they went into Tulsa on the Trail of Tears, they took their black slaves with them. Those treaties are still in effect today. And for some reason, we ain't trying to force those, except for Demario Solomon Simmons and Dr. Claude Anderson. But I, I don't understand why we not trying to enforce laws that are still on the books now being enforced for the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians. Um, so you can go to um, Incobra's official website as well, official uh, IncobraOnline.com for more information on this. Once again, this is not an endorsement on one reparations group or another. I don't belong to any of them. I'm just I'm just here doing a presentation. OK, now. What are municipal reparations? Now, part of the part of the confusion then with municipal reparations is probably one because it's so new, and the uh, city that led the way for municipal reparations at the city level would be Evanston, Illinois, in 2021. I know Robin Ruth Simmons. I just interviewed her for the second time on the African History Network show Monday. She uh, this past Monday, she was the. Uh, all the woman at the fifth ward, all the woman who spearheaded uh, this uh, this reparations initiative in uh, Evanston, Illinois. Municipal reparations deals with using policies, ordinances, et cetera, at the local city level to repair the city damage of discriminatory policies the city used to inflict harm upon a specific population. Generally speaking, the, uh, the municipal reparations deals with a city repairing the damage that the city is responsible for doing, okay, throughout history. It's, it, this, the cities, cities across the country don't have the resources to repair the damage that the federal government did. But oftentimes they can repair the damage 
or at least some of the damage that the city is responsible for based upon laws and policies put in place. Municipal reparations deals with the city repairing the damage. The city was responsible for causing not repairing the damage the federal government was responsible for. Okay, now, um, one of the, I think one of the problems that causes confusion with municipal reparations, and I, I'm not one that really advocates, this may go outside this to cover to some people's awareness, but I'm not one that really advocates using the term reparations a lot and i'm gonna explain why okay especially in this climate in this country with the attack on diversity equity and inclusion with with affirmative action and college admissions just being overturned by a 6-3 conservative supreme court that donald trump put in place okay with what's going on down in florida okay you know uh, i i liken it let me let me calm down i like i liken it i like it to this has has anybody ever studied the history of slavery in this country Raise your hand. I'm not going to give you a quiz. Just raise your hand. Who wants to answer this question? You don't have to come to the mic. Why did most slaves who run away run away at nighttime and not in the daytime? Don't everybody answer the question at the same time? Why, why did most slaves who run away run at nighttime run away at nighttime and not in the daytime? Huh? They don't get caught. Yeah, but they, have, they knew they had a better chance of getting away. Yeah. Run away in the darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, now. In the, in the case of Evanston, Illinois, they did not have a history of slavery, but they did have a rampant history of housing discrimination. Now, in preparation for my first interview with Robin Ruth Simmons, I read a lot of that 70-page home report that Dean, uh, the, the local historian Dino uh, Robinson put out because he was commissioned by city council. So anybody thinks you can do reparations without doing a home report, uh, I beg to differ on you, with you on that, okay? Now, what they found... You see, the state of Illinois abolished slavery in 1818, okay? Different, different states abolished slavery at different times. Michigan abolished slavery in 1837. And I'm going to get into this presentation. Michigan didn't have tens of thousands of slaves. 1837, at best, uh, Michigan, well, Michigan had probably about 23 yeah. in 1837, about, uh, about uh, 73 in 1773. Mississippi had 430,000 in 1860. So don't take this the wrong way. But 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 I, I when I hear people, and I speak across the country, and I I'm on platforms across the country, when I when I hear people talking about slavery, slavery, slavery in Detroit, yeah, the, the Underground Railroad, Second Baptist. My mother's a historian of the Underground Railroad. Yeah, it was slavery here. This ain't Texas. Texas had 250,000 slaves in June of 1865 when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Texas to deliver General Order Number 3, which is why you commemorate June 19th. We don't even understand the history of June 19th because that wasn't the last day. Delaware and Kentucky didn't abolish slavery until December 18th, 1865. Tennessee didn't abolish slavery until February 22nd, uh, 1865. So Juneteenth is not the last day of slavery. And the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the slaves either. That's a that's another conversation. All right. Now, reparations and any process for restorative relief must connect between the harm imposed and the city. Not what you think happened, but what actually happened, the harm imposed and the city. The strongest case for reparations by the city of Evanston is the area of housing. Why? Because... Evanston wasn't founded until 1853. Evanston was founded after slavery ended in 18, 1818 in Illinois. Evanston, Illinois did not have a history of slavery. And I heard all these reparations people running around talking about that's not reparations for slavery. You're right, because they don't have a history of a reparations for slavery. They don't have a history of slavery. Evanston is a city of 60,000 people. The black population is 16% and declining. A city is not going to try to repair the damage that the city wasn't responsible for creating. You got to go to the federal government for that. And so you got to understand, see, this is why, see, my teachers, Dr. Linda Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kyle Hyatt, Walker Kamene, taught me how to do a systems analysis. Okay, this is why a lot of this stuff out here you don't see me involved in. Because I already know I ain't going to go anywhere. Because I'm listening. And I'm like, okay, the plan that you're laying out to try to get to where you say you want to get to, that's not going to get you there because you haven't properly analyzed the problem. All right, so the strongest case for reparations in the city of Evanston is the area of housing where there is sufficient evidence showing the city's part 
in housing discrimination as a result of the early city zoning ordinances in place between 1919 and 1969 when the city banned housing discrimination, 1969, after the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Now, you got some people who say, well, we need a anti-black hate crime bill. Okay, well, that's, that sounds good, but Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Section 601, non-discrimination, fairly assisted programs, is why race-based policies are illegal at the federal level. And I learned this when I was on a committee to write an executive order uh, for the city of Detroit and the Kwame Kilpatrick administration. And our, cor our corporate counsel, Chair McPhail, our first, our very first meeting, because it took us 13 months to get this done, because it was much more complicated than we thought. Once we got in, took everything apart, and realized what we were dealing with, it was it, it took us three times as long to get this completed. And she told us at our very first meeting, she said it's illegal for us to write policies that are only for black people in the city of Detroit. But what we can do is we can write policies for Detroit-based residents, which would disproportionately help African Americans. You have the same thing at the federal level. Go to archives.gov. Anybody ever read the 1964 Civil Rights Act? Like the whole act. Go to archives.gov, because I go read this stuff. I go study these laws. This is why you hear me talk about political self-defense. If, if everything they do to us, they use the law to do it. And then when they get caught breaking the law, they go hire an attorney at law to defend them in the court of law. So doing the systems analysis, that would tell me we need to understand the law better than they understand the law and know how to disarm them of that weapon. That's political self-defense. All right, now, go to... If ever, because this is on the city of Evanston, Illinois website, all this information dealing with what they did. You can read that city of Evanston.org. Okay. All right. Now, compared to federal and state governments, courts or private institutions, municipalities are the most suitable for reparations, most suitable for reparations at the local level. Here's why two reasons why of the various levels of government. They are the proper locus for two reasons. First, as Howard University political scientist Dr. Naambi Carter explains, and I know Naambi, we've been on Roland Martin and filtered together before. She said there is a political will for reparations present in municipalities at the locals in the cities that is absent at the gridlock state and federal level. So the first thing you have to understand in doing a systems analysis is, is what is needed to advance what you say you want. How many votes are needed? How many, how many votes does it take to get a bill passed in the House of Representatives? Who can tell? Don't everybody speak at the same time. Who can tell? 218. Bomani got it. All right. I got a prize for you at the end, Bomani. All right. Now, in the House of Representatives, unless it's a bill that qualifies for the budget reconciliation process, or unless you're dealing with judges because of what Mitch McConnell did to the Senate, how many votes does it take to get a bill passed in the Senate? Page 60. Okay. No Republicans in the Senate support reparations. So how are you going to get a reparations bill passed? No Republicans, not even the black one, not even Tim Scott supports reparations. He was the first one that came out, said he wasn't voting for it. And none of the black Republicans in the House of Representatives support reparations either. So if you, so how are you going to get it passed? Okay. I'm going to tell you how you get it passed, but hold on. Let's, let's continue. Now, Dr. Nan Carter said, it's really local activists and local actors, members of city councils who are empowered in ways in their small communities to do things and to act outside of what the state would do and even the nation would do. Dr. Nambi Carter, how you doing, brother? You all right? All right. So at the local level is where we have more power. At the local level is where we have so so in the House of Representatives, there are 435 members in the House of Representatives. There's a, a we 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 make up only about 12 percent of the House, and we make up three and a half percent of the Senate. And I say three three and a half percent because half the time Senator Tim Scott don't act like he's black. So you get so so that's that's what you have in the Senate, okay? But across the country, our city councils 60, 70, 80 percent. OK, now the reason why they're in place is because African Americans organized and voted and put them in place. And many of them, like in the city of Detroit, saw that because black people were harmed by policies from the city of Detroit, it was their duty to use their political power to do something about their harm. Now, if you're black and you get elected and you don't do anything to help the people put you in office and repair the damage, then what the hell good are you? Okay. 
So that's why at the local level for municipal reparations, there's more power and that's why there's been more movement. That does not mean we don't need repairing of the damage from the federal level. That means you're going to have to use another strategy and it, it, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Okay? Now, by contrast, former U.S. Representative, the Honorable John Conyers, introduced a reparations bill in every session of Congress from 1989 until his passing in October 2019. But these bills never came to a vote. The, the farthest H.R. 40 has made is out of a budget, is out of a, a House subcommittee. And that was in like 2021. That's the farthest he's got. And although President Biden indicated his support for a reparations commission, any sudden action is unlikely. If you read the 1,000 page California Reparations Task Force, please don't take this the wrong way. We don't need another study. Okay? You know who was that? Tina Turner had that song, You Don't Need Another Hero. Look, if you read that, you don't need another study because we're going to get studied to death. Okay? Now, I'm talking about at the federal level. You don't need enough state at the federal level. E each municipality needs to do a harm report about what specifically happened in that city. Okay, now, this federal reluctance isn't entirely lamentable. Although local policymaking is often undervalued, decisions made closer to home can have larger impacts on Americans' everyday life than decisions made in Washington. That doesn't mean what happens in Washington is not important. It's extremely important, but at the local level, we have more control and more ability to use that power to bring about solutions to help everyday African-Americans. All right, now, second, the second reason Dr. Niambi Carter lays out, political scientists, municipalities provide the, op provide the opportunity for community-centered reparations that other levels of government do not. A local approach allows for powerful, close-to-home storytelling, enabling greater understanding of connections between past and present. In turn, this animates the development of thoughtful, conducive reparations. Additionally, municipalities can solicit input more easily from community members and encourage their involvement, okay? Now, a municipality-based approach allows for accessibility and proximity between government and beneficiaries once the policy is in place. Such a plan can more effectively empower the community and enable rebuilding relationships with perpetrators of the injustice if you want to rebuild those relationships. Now, so for more information, read this. This is a, uh, this is a good report here. This is by... Brooke Simone, University of Michigan Law School, is called Municipal Reparations, Considerations, and Constitutionality. That's on pages 350 to 351. Part of the confusion is, and I, I searched online for hours trying to find a working, clear definition of municipal reparations, and I'm still searching. So when I, I graduated from Wayne State's Business School in 1994, okay? One of the things we learn is that it's very hard to solve the problem when you can't define what it is that you're trying to achieve. Okay. So the first, the first thing, even though I had, to, even though I knew what I wanted to put in this presentation, the first thing I had to do was come up with a working definition of what municipal reparations is. The otherwise you're just shooting at a target you can't see. And then what happens is just like how, how Republicans and conservatives hijack critical race theory and critical race theories existed since the 1960s. Okay. And they made, they, they hijacked it and co-opted it and made it into what they wanted, wanted to be. Now, anything that, that deals with racism or slavery or anything like that, now they call that critical race theory and then they attack it. That's why you have to clearly define what it is you're talking about. Because, and see, that's why I, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but see, that's why, especially, on the national level, even here in Detroit, you have to understand right-wing conservative radio and right-wing cable news, Fox News. Fox News, that's the most popular cable news network. Now, if you watch it, you can say, you, you may say, how is this the most popular? These people are crazy. Well, look at the rest of America. It's representative and they prey on fear. They help to, they help to spread the lies about what critical race theory is. Fox News, okay? So what, what I'm, what, one of the things what, what I think in this city, across the country, we have to also develop better strategies on how we're messaging what it is that we want. And let me give you an example out of San Francisco, because I studied what happened in 
San Francisco, San Francisco Reparations Task Force, right? They released about uh, over 100 policy recommendations. Somebody in the meeting, in the audience, said all black people should get $5 million reparations. No formula. It's not just, just $5 million, okay? Now, if you go Google articles dealing with the California reparations, the San Francisco Reparations Task Force and their policy recommendations, the $5 million made up 80 to 90% of the media coverage. Now, apparently nobody did the math. Because when I was on Rolling Show and Faraji Muhammad showed the culture on the Black Star Network and the African History Network show, I broke down the math. There are 50,000 African Americans in San Francisco. When they put together their stipulations, requirements, because, see, the, the, the state of California also has a similar law like the federal government where race-based policies are illegal. That's why the California Reparations Task Force had to structure theirs based upon lineage as opposed to race because it's illegal. And they want to make sure anything that gets passed by the state assembly does not get overturned in courts. Because if, if, if conservatives sued to overturn uh, uh, President Biden's executive order on uh, student loans, and if you had Roe versus Wade overturned by a 6 3 conservative Supreme Court, you think there won't be lawsuits regarding this? Absolutely. When I talked to Robin Ruth Simmons three years ago, she said they were they, the way they structured it coming out of Evanston, it was structured to be able to withstand lawsuits because she said they knew they were coming. So, San Francisco, if 20,000 African Americans get $5 million, that's $100 billion. $100 billion is seven times the annual budget of the city of San Francisco that has an annual budget of $14 billion and was facing a two-year projected budget shortfall of $728 million. And African Americans are 6% of the population of San Francisco and 6% in the state of California. So I, I have the video, because I talked about this on my show. There was one city councilman from San Francisco. He was interviewed by a local news station. And they were talking about the $5 million. And he said, you know, we got over 100 policy recommendations. I'll be happy to talk about those. But white newscasters want to talk about the $5 million. They want to deal with fantasy. Because what they do is block, what they do is co-opt something, right? Make it into what they want, to, want it to be and then attack it to make sure you don't get it. This is how they've attacked critical race theory. Okay, critical race theory is not taught in K-12, through not according to Moms, Moms for Liberty, not according to Fox News. So we have to be careful of this. All right, Michigan's history of slavery. Well, I'm on time. Oh, Lord. Michigan's history of slavery, okay? Historian Tia Mills, a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies uh, and the 2011 recipient um, of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Uh, she cited in this article here, and I'll give you the name of it in just a second, but very quickly. Slavery in Detroit grew out of the bustling fur trade when the settlement was uh, under French control. So Detroit, they founded by the French, 1701, right? We learned that in elementary school, okay? The early censuses hosted by Tia Mills and her students revealed the number of slaves steadily increased through the years. Records from 1773 show there were 73 slaves in Detroit. The Detroit ain't Mississippi, even though a lot of our people, my parents, my dad came from Mississippi, his family, Detroit is not Mississippi. By 1782, the number of African slaves more than doubled to 170, not 170,000, not 17,000, 170. Even after the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 took effect, and it took effect clearly prohibiting slavery. And in the Northwest Ordinance, everybody researched this. It says neither slavery nor voluntary servitude shall exist in the territory because that's where the language from the 13th Amendment comes from. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And that wasn't created to re-enslave black people. We, we haven't studied the history of what happened. Slaveholders found loopholes in the language and continued as though nothing had changed. But look at what happened. And I mean, I'm going to skip some of this here. Okay, J Treaty 1793 uh, and 1795, Detroit nearly had 300 uh, African slaves. Read this article, Detroit's Dark Secret Slavery, Michigan Today, dot U-M-I-C-H dot E-D-U. That's um, uh, Michigan University, uh, University of Michigan. The 1830 U.S. Census showed 32 slaves living in the Michigan Territory because Michigan is not a state in the Union to 1837. 32 slaves in the Michigan Territory because the, the, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, what it did was it abolished bringing slaves into what was known as the Northwest Territory, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Massachusetts. All right. That's why Michigan has low levels. Also, the climate in Michigan, 
And uh, Michigan was not, uh, slavery was not essential to the economy of Michigan, where slavery was essential to Mississippi because the number one cash crop was cotton, especially after 1793. Okay, now, according to the terms of, now skip over that. Let's go to this here. Although the treaty seemed to violate the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which prohibited slavery northwest of the Ohio River. The original settlers in the region were allowed to retain their slaves since they were considered private property. Michigan's territorial judge, August B. Woodward, that Woodward Avenue is named after in Detroit, mandated that no new slaves could be introduced into the territory and gradually those who remained would either be emancipated or die so that by 1837, when Michigan became a state in the union, and, and they had a new constitution, a new state constitution that was created. There were only three slaves re residing in the state of Michigan. Okay, once again, yes, harm was done. Okay, but most of that is, is done after slavery ends in the state of Michigan. Okay, now let's skip over all this here. Slavery, let's see, let's look at this. How many African slaves were in Mississippi? Let's compare. Uh, uh, Michigan and Mississippi. Slavery grew rapidly in Mississippi during the decades before the Civil War. Civil War, 1861 to 1865. By 1860, Miss Mississippi's enslaved population was well over 430,000, while there were only 350,000 white people in the state of Mississippi. Yet most white people were not slaveholders, and even those who were, other than plantation owners, enslaved fewer than 10 African people. The state's economy was primarily based on the production of cotton, especially after 1793, when Eli Whitney creates the cotton gin. Do you have copies of the cotton gin? And then 1803, you have the Louisiana Purchase that doubles the territory of the U.S. and gives the U.S. more land to plant crops, which increases the need for enslaved African people. Let's skip over that the rest of it. What about Texas? We celebrate June 19th, Juneteenth. In Texas, slavery had continued as the state experienced no large-scale fighting or significant presence of Union troops. Texas was a safe haven for slaveholders, so they were so uh, there were very few battles during the Civil War in Texas. So slaveholders from Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia would take their slaves into Texas. Okay, uh, Texas had two hundred and fifty thousand enslaved Africans in June of eighteen sixty-five. All right, now, although emancipation didn't happen overnight for everyone, in some cases, enslavers withheld the information until the harvest season. The next harvest season, celebrations broke out among newly free black people, and Juneteenth was born. Read this article from History.com, official website of the History Channel. What is Juneteenth? Juneteenth and slavery in Texas, okay? Now, uh, read this article here done with the California Reparations Task Force. There's a link in the article to the full report as well as the 74 page executive summary. California Reparations Task Force releases final set of recommendations, June 29, 2023, CNN. Okay, now I'm gonna skip over some of this here, skip over that. Uh, the, uh, okay, the task force hired, the California Reparations Task Force hired a panel of experts, including economists, to calculate what black Californians have endured. The, uh, through their formula, because they created a formula, to, to, to do this. They determined that an eligible person could be owed up to $1.2 million. The formula includes dollars lost because of race-based health disparities, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, unjust land seizure, and other harms that have major impacts on Black Californians. California, even though they've identified somewhere between 1,500 to 4,000 enslaved people from 1850, when California becomes a state in the Union to 1860, California ain't Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee. California doesn't have a huge slave population either, but they have a huge, they have a, a deep history of segregation, housing discrimination, voter suppression, all those things, something similar to what happened here in the city of Detroit as well and the state of Michigan. This is at archives.gov, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, non-discrimination, fairly assisted programs, which is why race-based policies are illegal at the federal level. Now, uh, some people say we need an anti-black hate crimes bill. Well, first of all, the first hate crimes act in the history of this country was signed into law in 1968 by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was part of the Fair Housing Act, and it's part of the modern-day civil rights movement, largely for African-Americans, okay? Uh, secondly, people forget... Somehow the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill, which was the first anti-lynching bill in 122 years, since Representative George Henry White in 1900, who's the only black man left in Congress, okay, uh, presented the first anti-lynching bill. Okay, now, uh, there's a good article from NBCNews.com that talks about local reparations as well. Um, reparations gained historic momentum in 2023 because of California's efforts 
Read that at NBCnews.com. Now, here's why I, I don't use the term reparations for what we want. Two thirds of Americans are against reparations. There's a Pew Research study that was done in 2021. Read this article here, uh, Associated Press, APnews.com, February 24, 2023. Japanese Americans want redress, fight for black reparations. Because you have some Japanese Americans who were siding with African Americans to get some type of redress restitution. Only 30% of U.S. adults surveyed by the Pew Research Center supported reparations for slavery in some way for descendants of formerly enslaved people, 77% of whom were black Americans. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Support among Latinos and Asians were 39% and 33% respectively. And white Americans had the lowest rate of support at 18%. I think a lot of them watch Fox News. All right, now, what, one of the things that has to happen, yes, you have to have a harm report. That is extremely important. Uh, but two, focus, and I, and I deal with this in my presentations, focus on present-day structural inequities as opposed to just focusing on slavery because present-day structural inequities are the legacy of slavery. You have to deal with the laws and policies that were put in place that brought you to where you are and inflicted the harm. You can trace that back to slavery, Jim Crow segregation. But many people mean well, but when I hear people just keep talking about slavery, 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 I'm like, have you studied history from 1865 to like 2024? And what was put in place? Show how these policies are beneficial for everyone, not just African Americans, since most of the people that got a vote on this, especially at the state in the state legislature, okay, at the federal level, most of the people that got a vote on this are not African Americans. So when you can show how these policies are also good for Americans, because policies that are good for African Americans are good for America in general, period. Okay. Now, last last piece of evidence. Read this here, and I'm gonna sit down and shut up, okay? All right, now, California Reparations Task Force, unprecedented, they lay out unprecedented reparations, uh, uh, unprecedented uh, history of 150 years of anti-Black harm, okay? Uh, and if we look here, the California report covers not just the immediate impact of enslavement, 246 years in the U.S., but also the harms of decades of political neglect, finding that there has been sustained damage to generations of Black Americans. The damage has had a lasting effect on the political, economic, social, physical, mental, and cultural well-being of Black people. Now, what they do, they, they break it down into 12 harm. They still, they tell you in the, in the executive summary and in the introduction, it's more than 12 harms that have happened, but they focus on the 12 harms. They lay out the history of what happened, and then the 115 policy recommendations are designed to repair the damage of the 12. Enslavement, Racial terror, political disenfranchisement, housing segregation, separate and unequal education, racism and environment and infrastructure, pathologizing the black family, uh, control over creative, cultural and intellectual life, stolen labor and hindered opportunity. So a lot of that deals with uh, in prisons, especially privatized prisons. OK, now California did abolish privatized prisons right around 2020. OK, that passed the state legislature and signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom. Ten, an unjust legal system. Eleven, mental and physical harm and neglect. Twelve, the racial wealth gap. OK, now, uh, Detroit's history of racism. Uh, if we look at uh, 1930, the housing crisis, African-Americans in the city of Detroit was systemically shut out of the housing market due to structural racism, redlining. Uh, played an, an integral part in the housing crisis. 1940, 80% of Detroit residents aided, uh, abided by racial covenants. So that was uh, written into the deeds of homes that the homeowner could only sell that home to uh, non-African American people, non-Negroes, white people, okay? And that locked us out, many of us, from buying homes and accumulating wealth through the, uh, uh, through the uh, increase in the value of the home. Okay, now, 1943 race ride, June 1943, during World War II, up and down Woodward Avenue, 1943 race ride, I-375, removal of Black Bottom, sanctioned police uh, brutality, 1967 rebellion. That wasn't a ride, that was a rebellion. And we have rebellions all across the country. 1990, 1995, takeover of Detroit Public Schools, Detroit uh, bankruptcy as well, also over-assessing on property taxes. And when you study the history of that, that's one of the ways our land has been stolen from us. Yeah. I got an article from the Washington Post dealing with African Americans, uh, the value of our property taxes are oftentimes over-assessed, okay? And this has happened across the country. All right, now, lastly, this article right here, this, is, this proves my point here. This is a study from Citigroup Bank. 
Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion. This article is from CBSNews.com, September 23rd, 2020. This article deals with how over a 20-year period of time, not 246 years, just from the year 2000 to the year 2020, racism has cost the U.S. economy $16 trillion. They break it down three ways. One, black workers have lost $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree. Two, the housing market lost $218 billion in sales because black applicants cannot get home loans. Three, about $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the U.S. economy because African-American entrepreneurs could not get access to bank loans. Then they go on to tell you, what's more, the U.S. could have $5 trillion in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps, which are laws and policies, and others were closed today, the study indicated, which means... When, when you do good by us, that helps everybody. When you help repair the damage that's been inflicted upon African Americans, that helps everybody. That too, Stephen Biko, one of our great South African freedom fighters, said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. We must take our minds back and we do not ask permission to do it. All right, that's going to do it. I'm going to wrap up here. From our hotel at Santi Sana, thanks for your attention. Go to our website. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? There's a 10-week online history course called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. I teach the class on uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our next class, uh, next classes are Saturday, March 9th, Saturday, March 16th, March 23rd, and March 30th. Okay, and then we have a few more classes after that. The class is on sale, $80, regularly $130. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch this anytime. So even after the course is over with, you can go back and watch the entire class, okay? And we, we, instead of 10 sessions, we're going to do at least 11, possibly 12. The course outline, the lesson plans for all uh, 10 classes or 10 plus classes are laid out here and I'll go through and update it uh, periodically because we, we add a few additional subjects, but we take you through our history. We deal with thousands of years of history, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we deal with archeological discovery that have um, been, uh, have come out in the last uh, 10, 20. So uh, we deal with uh, Egypt on the Potomac and how the layout of Washington DC is based upon by ancient African principles coming out of uh, uh, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, meaning land of the blacks. Um, we look at the African origins of Star Wars and the Saurian drama. Uh, there's an excerpt of an interview that I did with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, that where we look at this information. We uh, look at um, the uh, Hannibal Barca and the Punic Wars, okay? And especially the Battle of Kanai, 216 BC. We look at Hannibal crossing the Alps, um, uh, crossing the Pyrenees, 219 BC, but the Battle of Kanai, 216 BC. Uh, the Battle of Zama, 202 BC, where Hannibal Barca is defeated by Publius Cornelius Scipio. And Publius Cornelius Scipio takes the surname Africanus after he defeats Hannibal Barca at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. Af Africa is not named after a Roman general. The Roman general took the surname Africanus after he defeated uh, Hannibal Barca. And we know that um, Africanus is Latin meaning belonging to Africa. It's Latin meaning belonging to Africa. We look at the 800-year uh, occupation of the Europe's uh, of the Africans known as the Moors, who take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And this is going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. OK, and we see the rise of Spanish conquest. We look at Christopher Columbus and Columbus is essential to the uh, expansion of the transatlantic slave trade and the exploitation of indigenous people and the exploitation of African people also. OK, so we go through and look at this uh, history chronologically. We also look at the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712. Willie Lynch never historically existed. Uh, I wish we would just throw the Willie Lynch letter in the garbage can where it belongs. It's. Uh, a historical. Uh, there, there are words in the Willie Lynch letter that didn't even exist in uh, the early 1700s. Okay, the sentence, the sentence structure, the syntax is not what they uh, is not coming from uh, England. That's 
uh, uh, 20th century uh, sentence structure in, in their words from the 20th century, from the um, industrial revolution and the automotive industry, things like that, that are in that letter. That was written about 1970 by Dr. Kwabina Ashanti, uh, who's come out and admitted he wrote the Willie Lynch letter and his Professor Manu and Pim, who I'll be interviewing later this month, who exposed Dr. Kwabina Ashanti as the author of the Willie Lynch letter. It's, 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 it's a fraud. Uh, Dr. Kwabina Ashanti meant well, but it's, I think it's done more harm than good. Okay, so uh, you can register for that course 